This is a video of the splinting and casting procedures produced as part of the Common Currency Project at the Dalhousie University Faculty of Medicine. There may be variations in the procedure from institution to institution, depending on supplies provided in the hospital, personal experience of the clinician, and clinical factors related to the injury. So now we're going to go over circumferential casting. And uh, casting might seem like a little bit of a scary thing for everybody when you first start it. And really, all it is is a bit of practice. So we have uh, Mike, our fabulous assistant here, who has ended up getting a fracture of his wrist. He fell out of an airplane. And uh, before we start doing this, you knowing that we're in the merge department, it's a good thing to set up everything in advance. So when I think about setting up in advance, I worry about my patient. I worry about the merge department. And sometimes I tend to worry about myself. Okay, so the big thing to know is that it's good to have a Johnny shirt, one of these little things here, available for your patient. And the reason we do this is just to protect his clothing. So Michael put on the beautiful outfit for us, like this. Okay, it's also important to tell your patient that uh, even if any of this gets on you, like I have on my pants here, it comes off with some water, just not to put it in the dryer. Okay, and then we take care of the department. So. In terms of taking care of the department, we grab a sheet or some paper and we throw it on the floor just to protect the floor and to make sure that the cleaning staff still likes us at the end of the day. All right, so I just tend to throw it on the floor like that. Go down. Okay, and then I put my bucket of water somewhere where it's easy to reach. Okay, again, I don't know how many times I'll reinforce this. Make sure you have lukewarm water available. This is a cast. And uh, for a cast, I tend to use a bit of less padding, usually about two layers. So we're looking at a, you know, less less protection of your skin. So um, lukewarm water will stop you stop you from having a big, strong, warm reaction on the skin, which can burn your patient. Okay, and I'm sure, I'm sure that Mike doesn't want to be burned. So we we'll put Mike in a position of function in terms of the cast. So casting is a little bit different than splinting in that you're actually going to have something wrapping all the way around the hand. It's generally used for fractures, or things that we want to immobilize so that they don't move, okay? So it's also good to know that since this might end up being a definitive treatment, that we want Mike to be able to use his fingers specifically for wrist injuries, okay? So when we cast, we're gonna to go to the distal palmar crease in terms of measurement, and again down to the elbow about two finger breasts below the elbow so that he can actually flex and bend his elbow. As mentioned before, casting is not a benign thing. So the reason we do this is to maintain function of our joints because we otherwise get joint stiffness. So this way he can keep using his hands, he can keep using his elbow, and he won't end up getting tons of stiffness. Okay? So we put him in a typical beer bottle drinking position. Depending on the injury though, we might have a change his position. If it's our typical Collie's fracture that we all allude to in the wrist, um, the difference with this is that we will have the hand put deviated uh, ulnarly and uh, forward like that, okay? So in this case, we're just immobilizing him. So I tend to use two inch Webrel because it's easy to work with and it's very, very important in terms of getting good padding, all right? So just before I start, I always make a thumb, a space for the thumb like that. Okay. Don't feel bad about tearing or ripping this stuff. You make it work for you. A lot of times when you start, you think you have to use what you have in front of you and you can't play with it. Well, this is all kind of an art, art, artsy kind of thing. So we can adapt to the situation, all right? So we grab Mike's thumb and it depends on which way you're rolling too. So when you're rolling this stuff, you want to make sure that you're rolling the roll away like this. If you roll like this, you're going to run into a lot of problems. So I made a little hole for his thumb, like that. I can place his thumb in there like this. And then I can roll it around like that. Again, I go to the distal palm of crease. Michael just keep his hand right there like that, which is right there, okay? And then slowly as I'm rolling, I try to make sure I don't have any nasty edges, okay? So I can tear anywhere I want. And this is where you can be fine and messy and you can clean it up after, okay? So we're rolling like that, and I want to get about two layers. So I usually I start with the hand. I'll roll up again to the distal palmar crease, and again, see as you come around the thumb, you can just tear a little bit, okay, like that. 
and just providing good padding and tear for the other direction like that. Okay, and again I have a nasty edge, so I just pull my edge off. All right, so you just keep the arm immobilized, and you're going going downwards like this. Okay. What I'm trying to do here is that I try to overlap my web roll about 50% each time. And depending on which way the hand is, I can just generally just pull it like that. Okay, so as I'm going around, there's different contours of the hand and the arm, right? So we see that his arm is actually beveling out this way. So what I'm doing is that each time when I, when I come down, is that I, I tend to pull a little bit more towards where the bevel is. So as I'm going, I generally hold the closest skin, 50 degree, 50% overlap, and I just tug a little bit at the side that's wider, like that, see? Okay, I'm tugging a little bit to make sure that it's fitting beautifully on this hand. And again, 50%, 50% overlap and tugging a little bit. Okay. Tugging a little bit all the way down so I make it to the elbow, all right? So I find where his elbow is and I go two finger breaths like this. I tend to go a little bit farther with the web roll because my, when, my, when my plaster goes on, I can have a nice overlap over it. So again, 50% like that, going down, tugging a little bit, and I keep it close to the skin, going down like that, okay? So it doesn't matter if it tears for you. You just restart your edge like that, okay? Come down to the very end, and I usually tend to go with two layers at the bottom here. I go around twice circumferentially like this. So now look at this. I've done my roll. And I'm not very worried because then I just tear it again. Okay. So I start my new roll. And just because I like it to fit nicely, I'll tear that one again too. So there I go. Here's my second layer like that. And now I go back the other way. Now the difference is that instead of pulling upwards, I'm actually tugging like this, going down. Okay. And again... 50% 50% overlap. So I can't stress how important the web roll is actually. It's almost more important than the plaster because it actually allows you to mold your cast beautifully in the end and allows you to have good soft tissue protection. So to go through 50%. Okay. If I have a nasty edge like you see forming here, I just will pull the edges away. Okay. Don't feel bad about pulling the edges away. Like that. Okay. Then I'm tugging. Go through, like that. And you can do it just as slow as you want for this stage, right? Okay, don't get it too far ahead of yourself like I just did. And you have a nice. So make sure that you have about two layers everywhere. You check your, cast, your web roll on the other side. I have a little bit of a defect. I can just fix my defect. Like that. Okay, so I have a nice fitting wear bow on. And then I just make it fit perfectly. There we go. So then I go with my plaster. Okay. Problem with plaster is that it tends to dry relatively quickly. So you don't have as much time to work with this. Again, it's not a benign substance. It's going to heat up on the hand. And uh, it's going to dry relatively quick. So I open it up. And things to keep in mind is that it does have edges on it, and the edges actually can end up irritating the skin and cutting into the skin later. So you want to make sure, again, that you're going to be at a distal palmar crease there, and you can just overlap it over as it's drying, as it's drying like that, okay? So what I do is I actually open everything that I need in advance. I tend to use about two two to four layers of plaster depending on how much I want for my fixation. If I'm worried my fracture is going to slip, I use a bit more, okay? So I make sure again that he's in a position of function, reminding myself that yes, he does have a fracture, so I don't want to refund his hand and make it hurt, okay? So then I grab my, my plaster and I put it into the water, all right? So when I put it in the water, it's, you just generally want to dunk it in and squeeze it, all right? So you dunk it in. Bring it out and give it a nice little squeeze like that. Okay, so it's wet. Then I have a bit to roll with. So when I start, I actually fold it like that, just to give myself a nice edge. And I place it between his thumb like that, at a distal palmar crease like that, so that it doesn't have an irritating edge for him, okay? And as you go through the thumb, you can just squeeze it through like that. Okay. 
pulling. And then you go down to about there. And the reason you have to be very careful with this is that when it dries, it can actually dry and impinge on a nerve there. So you want to have lots of space and ability for him to use his hand. Okay. Let me just go through like that. Okay. Again, I'm overlapping about 50, 50% each time. It's wrapping around. And I do this a bit faster because, again, we have a time limit now. If you're getting worried about it drying, you can just wet it a little bit more as you go. Right. I take my next roll, dunk it in the water again, give it a bit of a squeeze, pull back up just to give enough room from there. And this time I just overlap the edges there, so it has a nice edge. I'm going to the back and overlapping the edge like that. There you go. Making sure the thumb has room. Like that, and I squeeze through. The thumb area. Okay. And this is fun because now we're allowed to make a bit of a mess. It's like being in kindergarten again. And all of us love kindergarten, so we just keep going all the way down like that. Coming to the end, I usually do about two layers near the end there. Okay. And then just as I come to that, I just roll the end of my web roll up like that. Then I'll overlap it a bit with the plaster, being careful. I'll show you that when I wet the next roll. So next roll. Okay, so I'll just come down. And I'll just have a little bit of overlap like that. Don't worry about making a mess because it all comes off. Okay, this is a good time to even talk to your patient, get to know him a bit better. Ask him what he thinks of the weather. And it's also a good time to teach them a bit about the cast and what to do with it. So I just keep going. Like that. And again, now we're coming to the point where it's very important to mold your cast. Okay, so I can just wet my hands, make sure they're clean. Just quickly. Okay, don't worry, I won't die. Going around like that, make sure it's nice. Conforming the cast the way I want it. Making sure he has room at his thumb. He has good ability to use his fingers. Okay. It's all nice. Then I, this becomes the most important part in a couple seconds here. I'll show you. So you make sure there's room in the thumb here for that nerve. Okay. So that you're not squeezing there. And then the next thing to do is the molding. So you bring his arm down. You want to actually create a good mold, right? At your fracture site. The fracture site is here. It's very important to have a ratio of 1 to 0.7 on this diameter here. That's what holds your fracture. Anything wider than that, you get movement to your fracture. You have, so you hold it nice and tight there. Okay, like that. At the fracture site there. Okay. And as it's slowly drying, you just rub your arm, hand down like that. You can pretty it up slowly as it's drying. The key here is that this is when you have a chance to mold it. Really important to make sure he's in the right position. Like that. You're just bringing it down like that, molding it nicely against his arm. Okay. All right, so when when we're done this and done the molding, it's important to instruct your patient that you know he cannot get his cast wet after he's done. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for the cast to heal properly. Okay, but he makes sure that he doesn't put anything in his cast. So absolutely no foreign objects, no lucky coins, no chopsticks to rub or scratch his arm with. Okay, and again, before we start, we checked his we checked his cap refill. We made sure that his fingers went from pink, from white to pink in about two seconds. That he had good sensation. He had normal ulnar and median and nerve function. Okay, so when we're coming near the end here, we have a really nice mold. See, it's about 0.7 to one. Okay, he's able to move his hands, and he's able to use the elbow. Okay, so to make it just look pretty and not bumpy, I just wash my hands again, so I get rid of these little divots. I sometimes will grab a little bit of the web rule like this, overlap it, cut it, like that. 
wet it a bit. Okay. And you can just easily smooth out the parts that you don't like there. Which makes a really pretty cast. Okay, he's not to write on his cast for approximately two days. And he's to keep his arm elevated above his heart for also the same interim, about 24 hours to 48 hours. Okay, because there's a good chance of swelling after he's done. All right. There we go. We have a cast there. And then it's really easy to just wash up his hand after you're done. And if it looks pretty, the patient's usually pretty happy and happy with you. All right. Before we um, let him go, we actually take a picture of his arm before he is um, casted and a picture of it after he's casted, just to make sure that there's no change in position of your either your reduction or something new has occurred. Okay. So then we can just easily clean him up there. Okay. I always also have a handy towel available, which I can just wet like that to clean his hands. Okay. So as the patient's leaving, make sure you tell him, elevate his hand above his heart for about 24 to 48 hours, not to wet his cast ever, not to write on his cast for 24 to 48 hours, to make sure he has no numbness or tingling. Should he have numbness or tingling, he has to come back right away to the merge, to make sure that, he does, that when he f- touches his finger, it goes from white to pink within two seconds to make sure that he's not putting any foreign objects within his cast, okay? And also to remind him that any plaster that's on his clothing will wipe off easily with water. And then finally, last but not least, is when you're done, clean your area up. Nobody likes to clean up after you, so make sure that the floor looks clean that all your things are put away nicely, and that when you're putting your water away, it's really important to use, a, to use a specialized sink, which has a trap in it, because the plaster can actually sediment in the pipes and uh, cause overflows, which are not good. So use a special sink made for the plaster, the trap in it.